Hello and welcome back. We are in module 4. Uh, so today we will start with part 2, second part of module 4. So, so far uh, we have looked at data from aphasia and epileptic patients and uh, the data so far has uh, told us that the, there is a possibility that uh, the L1 first language and the second language of a person might be represented differently in the human brain. So, uh, various sort kinds of data have been discussed. So, this is all in the uh, background that is uh, that is that's what we discussed till the last part. So, today we will move forward and look at where the current state of the affair is and what we know today. So, starting from the background of aphasia and epileptic patients data, now we move on to experimental processing uh, data from the processing studies in recent times and what this um, points towards. So, this entire uh, part will be uh, discussed uh, in terms of data that have taken three important variables into consideration. These three variables are age of acquisition, proficiency and the control mechanisms. Now, these three are important um, aspects we have already seen that age of acquisition plays an important role in terms of how the second language uh, proficiency builds up. So, they are connected, proficiency and age are connected and also how um, age of acquisition also change uh, turns into whether it is a simultaneous bilingual or somebody becomes a successive bilingual and what are the repercussions. So, uh, as a result of which the data existing data already points towards the fact that these probably are uh, important um, uh, variables to take into account while we look at the representation of language um, in the human brain, different languages in the human brain of a, a bilingual. So, let us start with the first uh, and uh, most important one, age of acquisition. Now, if you remember, we have already looked at um, aphasia data and how rule of Ribo says that the language that is learned first, which is the language learned in infancy, that is the first language will be uh, less affected as opposed to the second language, which is learned later in life. Because the uh, Ribo's rule says that the the any memory that is earlier that is that is connected to infancy will be more resistant to any kind of damages. So, uh, as a result we will discuss Ribo again here because of the way his theories have had a very um, a great impact on all these um, connected areas. So, the French psychologist Ribo and he um, how he basically put the aspect of age into consideration. So, he basically said how our minds are put together is a factor of age. It is not uh, it because the brain develops over a period of time and through different stages and hence it needs to be taken into account. So, the first part of the life's journey is when the brain development happens very quickly. There are dramatic uh, changes that happen at that time and the memories of connected, uh, collected during that time are what is he calls organic memory. So, this idea has been taken up uh, in modern day literature uh, to, to look at if the relevant literature has uh, uh, and does point to the same aspect as he said. So, there are basically two things to keep in mind when we uh, take Ribot's rule to understand language lateralization in the bilingual brain. One is that age of initial learning plays a very important role in adult processing. So, how and what we acquired in our childhood plays a very important role in our adulthood. This is almost common sense. Um, we know that the kind of exposure that um, one might have or not have in early childhood will, will shape the person as they are. That is why do we say that um, depending on the kind of exposure the child has had, it will help him or her tackle things better in life later on. So, this is basically where it all boils down to. So, the kind of t uh, training, the kind of exposure the person has had in the initial stages of life will make him, uh, will, will uh, reflect in the processing of any kind of information language included later in life. That is the first part of the, st of the story. Second part is that which is also connected to the first part is dependent on how the brain development happens. What are the changes? What are the stages of those changes that uh, we notice from infancy to adulthood in the human brain? One interesting thing about human brain is that it continues to develop after birth. 
for a quite for quite some quite some time. So as a result, it is very important to understand brain development uh, as concurrent with the other kinds of development as one ages uh, as one grows older through various kinds of socio-cultural and other kinds of experiences the brain is simultaneously growing. So uh, language is also one of the aspects in the environment. So from that perspective also it is crucial. So um, the question basically is in terms of brain's growth that which areas develop early and which areas develop later in life. Now, this is already well known in neuroscience that there are certain domains in the brain that develop early, certain domains that develop much later. Now, if we bring that understanding to language and language processing among bilinguals, basically there are two things that emerge. How are different brain areas dependent on uh, different, um, uh, are connected to let us say to different language processing. So, is there uh, a difference in terms of the brain areas and language activation as, a, as a, in terms of L1 and L2. So, processing of one's native language and second language um, and their dependence on dip different areas is what the crux of the matter here is. So, in terms of that, uh, so this is how we can put it in a more simplistic way. So, native language, uh, do we see a parallel? in terms of native language processing with respect to those areas in the brain that develop earliest in our life. Similarly, if is L2 dependent on those areas that are developed later in life. So, that is basically the uh, main uh, the, the question that we are trying to understand. Before we get into the uh, experimental data, we will look uh, slightly into the uh, diff different brain areas and their sensory motor mapping. Uh, there, these are the main areas, these are the main lobes that we that are important in terms of sensory motor uh, mapping of the human brain. So, occipital lobe is uh, primarily devoted to visual processing, temporal lobe is uh, for auditory processing and this is uh, this is the transfer point. Okay? So, this basically the entire back brain is devoted to the uh, sensory processing. Now, sensory input is very easy to say that the a particular area in the brain is devoted to sensory processing, but this is not a simplistic uh, thing. How it happens basically is that there are there are signals that are uh, received at the lowest end and then they transmit uh, through various corresponding nerves, then to thalamus and finally into the sensory cortex. So, starting from the hands let us say uh, when we touch something, when we touch a uh, rough surface versus a smooth surface that understanding that difference in tactile sensation goes to our brain via this kind of a network. So, as a result of which there are devoted areas in the brain, there are sensory maps in the brain that uh, come from their respective cortical areas depending on the uh, kind of sensory input that we get. So, uh, occipital lobe has primary visual area and that uh, pans out and then includes more and more complex forms of visual processing. Similarly, there is um, the same thing also happens in the, in the other, other systems, other kinds of information. So, this is basically it. So, there are the way this uh, pans out and the way it is broken down into smaller units and so on. Similarly, the brain also has a motor map. Uh, the motor map is basically the way motor actions are carried out uh, by the human body. So, hands for example are used for writing, for eating, for um, lifting things and so on and so forth. So, various kinds of motor activities are carried out by the hands. So, there is a mental map, there is a cortical map of these kinds of motor activities as well. So, um, this, this is actually in fact we often talk about the motor map as a corresponding map of the sensory map. So, sensory and motor uh, map in the human brain. Now, one crucial thing about this map is that it is not really representing body parts as such, right. So, there is no hand part in the brain or a leg part in the brain, but rather it is more of a, the amount of stimulation or movement. So, the amount of sensation we receive through our hands is much less as opposed to let us say the amount of sensation we receive from our uh, feet. So, we can use our hands for a large number of uh, activities as opposed to the feet. So, this as a result there is a division, there is a difference between the various uh, parts of the body in terms of the, the load, the amount of stimulation and the amount of motor movement that they 
represent. So, similar representation is there in the brain. So, when we say a, a sensory motor map, this is what we mean, right. So, as a result, hands have a larger uh, representation uh, in terms of both sensory and motor map, ok. So, this is basically how it looks. This is called homunculus or the little man in our brain. Uh, so, these are the different areas and you see the in sensory cortex, sensory um, somatosensory cortex, the sensory map basically has a large area for the for face. So, eyes and nose and uh, mouth and uh, tongue and so on because we taste uh, through taste we understand about the world to a large extent and so on. So, this is funnily it is called a cortex man if it was a human, if the sensory map was a human, if the um, uh, motor map was a human this is how it will look. So, this is just to give you an idea about what we mean by the sensory motor map in the brain because this is what we will uh, be use, uh, using for understanding the later things. Now, as we had started talking about that the brain development is marked by neurological changes from the starting from the very early stages the brain basically goes through a lot of changes, lot of changes in terms of uh, creating new uh, neurons, producing new neurons and some neurons will die and new connections will be ma made, some connections will die out and so on and so forth. Various things happen uh, for a long time uh, in the in the child's brain uh, in the initial stages. So, basically there are it is a complex process and involving very many layers of development, but uh, to put it simply this is the these are the stages of brain development in the children. So, they start the development happens from right to left and then primary to secondary to tertiary level and then from basal to cortical. Basal as in the middle of the brain, cortical is the top part. So, the outer part of the brain that is what we are mostly uh, focusing our studies on. So, cortical areas, areas in the cortex. Now, these are uh, this is uh, this was proposed by Best in 1988, but uh, current techniques also uh, confirm this kind of a this kind of a trajectory. Now, for infants sensory cortices develop the earliest as we were talking about just a little while ago. So, sensory cortex develops the first because uh, when the child when a small child is trying to uh, interact with the world, negotiate with the world you know crawling around and uh, touching everything and uh, to see. So, this is when this is the sensory motor stage of the child's development and hence sensory motor uh, map in the brain also develops in the very beginning the initial part of life. And then this is followed by the development of what is called sensory bridges in the parietal loop ok. And then the most anterior part of the brain uh, in the prefrontal cortex develops the latest. So, this is the, the trajectory the starting with the back brain the sensory motor cortex to parietal to prefrontal cortex. For all these names um, what, what for, for example, what anterior means and so on there is a uh, simple map here you can refer to all right. So, this is what we already know. Now, how is the connection to language uh, meaningful in this kind of a scenario? Now, uh, one of the first studies to look at this uh, to, to map uh, the sensory motor development and other developments in the brain with language function and to see if there is there are differences across uh, you know, languages first language versus second language if that kind of a um, correspondence really exists. One of the first studies were what is called word recognition literature. Uh, it goes back uh, to 95, one of the uh, very well known studies from that time. They had carried out an LDT, LDT we have already talked about this is lexical decision task. Lexical decision task is a task simple, simple task where the participants have to check between among different uh, letter strings to check whether they are a word or not. So, for example, um, if, if this is a word in English and as far as I know this is not a word in English. Now, this is called a non word this is called a word. The task would be to figure out which is a word a very simple task of comprehension. So, this was done on uh, monolingual participants. But the, um, uh, the manipulation here was the words that were supplied uh, that were used as stimulus were divided on two terms. One they were divided in terms of when they were acquired certain certain words are acquired early in life certain words are acquired much later in life right. The, and then this is so hence this was one of the differences another difference was how fre high frequency or low frequency word they were. So, they were 
the different differed on their uh, frequency rating high frequency versus low frequency as well as whether they were learnt early or they were learnt late. So, on these both parameters they, they were checked and they found that the results found that the effect of age of acquisition, age of acquisition is written like this AOM. Um, but they did not find any effect of frequency. So, basically if the age of acquisition was the, uh, the manipulation here with, meaning that if it is the words that are learned early versus words that are learned different uh, later there will be a difference. However, they did not find any uh, difference in terms of frequency. Another study a little later found out that both AOA and frequency had an effect on picture in picture naming task but earlier study in LDT we did not find an effect. So, what do we mean by effect here? The idea was to check if the sensory motor areas or the prefrontal cortex are utilized as we have seen here. So, uh, because we know already sensory motor areas are developed earlier compared to the uh, frontal lobe functions. So, frontal lobe functions are developed much later. So, one, what they wanted to see on all, all of these studies was if the early learned words are activating the, are activating the sensory motor domain or uh, let and later. So, what is the mapping between these right. So, again another study uh, by uh, Hernandez and his and his group showed that world, words learned early in early childhood led to activity in the speech sound processing area basically the sensory motor area. Similarly, uh, words learned later that is uh, the age of acquisition of effect uh, later they, they relied more on the brain areas where which is inferior frontal lobe. So, this is crucial. So, frontal lobe versus the uh, occipital or the back brain. So, sensory motor area versus the frontal lobe. So, this is uh, frontal lobe basically activation in this area means effortful access to processing. So, words learnt later were processed here, words learnt early were processed in the area which is based on which is dependent on speech sound processing. So, again this sound this, uh, this kind of pattern of processing shows a parallel to brain areas development that is sensory cortex develops earliest and prefrontal cortex develops much later. So, there is a correspondence between words that are learnt early versus words that are learnt later and their processing areas. So, uh, we have already talked about sensitive period and critical period before. So, there I have mentioned a little bit here again uh, one can go through but we will not um, discuss it again. So, um, there are again another other kinds of tasks. So, we saw uh, as of now we have seen that age of acquisition of words early learnt words versus late learnt words um, are processed in two different parts of the brain the corresponding areas that develop early versus late. Similarly, different kinds of tasks have also found difference. So, um, the brain maturation expands to frontal lobe uh, as the brain maturation process the the, the strategies that, that we, we use to process also changes. So, different aspects of language as, as a result are uh, also processed differently in terms of age. So, 1990s onward we have a lot of studies uh, that, that reported on this line uh, typically involving PET or fMRI on various kinds of neuroimaging techniques uh, that have looked at bilingual brain. So, uh, once a study found that native language led a led to wider area of activation whereas the later learned language engaged a smaller area. So, you see there are differences that in terms of language the development. So, whether it is a native language meaning L1 or whether it is L2. Uh, so, L1 is utilized uh, in a much wider area uh, in terms of this and L2 was uh, devoted to a smaller area right. Another task, the task over here was given that they have to listen to stories in, in their L1 as well as in their L2. Now, how they, what they found out was in, uh, that different, different kind of activation in different kinds of areas. Another study that was which is, a, which is an fMRI study, the previous one was PET, this is an fMRI study uh, that looked at finer differences as in the differences in within bilinguals themselves but early bilingual versus late bilingual. The previous study looked at uh, L1 versus L2 here we are looking at early versus late bilinguals and the task was to say in their head what they did before basically to internally talk to yourself and the cues were either morning or in the afternoon as in when. So, what did you do in the morning yesterday, what did you do in the afternoon yesterday like this. 
there were cues and also they had to uh, do this activity either in their second language or in their uh, first language. What they found was very interesting. In case of uh, Wernicke's area, primary language areas are Broca's area and Wernicke's area that you already know. So, in case of Wernicke's area, they found overlapping pattern. So, for both uh, L1 and L2, they had found similar kind of pattern in uh, Wernicke's area. However, in case of Broca's area, uh, early bilinguals showed an overlapping activation, but in case of late bilinguals, there were two clearly separate areas. So, there was a slight difference in terms of when the second language was acquired. If it was an early, early acquired language, one kind of pattern, late acquired language, a different kind of pattern only in terms of production that is in terms of broker's area. In terms of comprehension, not much of difference was found. Similarly, there were also EG studies, electroencephalography studies and um, in case of EEG, what we uh, study, what is the output is ERP. So, ERP is event related potential. There are many uh, signals of ERP that are studied in terms of language, but the primary ones are N400, N200 and P600. N400 is a negative going peak at 400 milliseconds. So, ERP signals are basically they are like sine waves. So, like this it goes ok and so this is a negative going peak and this is a positive going peak. So, when there is a negative going peak at 400 millisecond it is it is the N400 signal. Similarly, N200 is there and, and, uh, and there is P600, P for positive, N for negative. Now, N400 is, a, is an indicator of semantic anomaly. So, when you have uh, trouble processing a sentence in terms of its meaning, we will see an N400 effect. So, I take my tea without sugar and tree till here things were fine. As soon as the word tree comes in, there is a problem in processing that information because there is a semantic anomaly. Tree typically do not have, does not have anything to do with tea. Right, so that is when we find N400. N, N200 is on the other hand um, connected with grammatical processing. So, when you have this sentence has a structural anomaly, the pizza was in the eaten, this is the problem word. So, when this kind of a sentence is uh, processed, we typically find N200 effect and P600 is uh, associated again with grammatical processing, but typically with garden path sentences. Uh, linguistry students will know what cut and path sentences are. This is a typical example. The broker persuaded to sell the stock was tall, right. So, this kind of sentence. So, these are the three kinds of ERP signals that we typically study in terms of language processing. So, nine, one 1996 study by Neville and uh, Fox found out that in case of monolinguals, errors will typically show N200 and P600 effect because both of these are uh, connected to syntactic uh, problems, syntactic anomalies the, when the grammatical structure is wrong, right. So, now they wanted to find out if these components will differ among bilinguals differentiated in terms of age of acquisition. So, if a early bilingual versus late bilingual difference uh, is what they were looking at. The targets and the, the sentences were like this, a scientist criticized Max's off proof of the theorem. So, this is a, a grammatically wrong sentence. Now, the early negativity that is N200 was found to be reduced in all learners, but late learners did not show reanalysis. Reanalysis is typically uh, P600. So, late learners did not show a P600 effect. Early learners showed indication of reanalysis at later stage, which is so early learners show uh, neither of the groups showed N200 effect, but late learners did not also show. P600 effect that is the difference. So, there was a difference in terms of age of acquisition even within bilingual group itself. Yet another study quite uh, rather well known study they did with uh, late learners and native speakers of English language. So, the results here showed that native speakers showed both early negativity and late positive positivity which is expected that uh, late learners will in the previous study this was not found. Late learners on the other hand did not show early negativity that is N200 was missing. Late positivity showed was, was spread across large area of the brain and extended over a longer period. So, again we see difference between native speaker versus late bilinguals. Earlier we have already seen early and late, late bilingual difference, now we see this. 
Then there are many other similar studies that um, basically prove that late learners use a very different mechanism to, uh, to, to process grammatical information as opposed to native speakers and early learners. In fact, the, there is a lot of similarity between early uh, bilingual and the native speakers. Late bilinguals are always, they always are found to use different uh, kinds of techniques. Similarly, another uh, fMRI studies on grammatical errors also have found uh, very interesting results. So, in this study, they used German and Italian bilingual. Now, uh, German and Italian bilinguals were shown sentences that had error in case, number and gender in German and number and gender in Italian. So, we have case marking, number marking, gender marking in language. So, Italian German uh, bilinguals were, were the volunteers for this study and this is uh, what they saw was sentences that had errors in all of these counts. The findings show that late bilinguals show increased activity in the prefrontal cortex near Broca's area which we already know. Early bilinguals did not show any difference in the brain's blood uh, flow mechanism, uh, blood metabolism. Uh, fMRI, stu fMRI studies are basically uh, based on blood flow to the amount of blood flow to certain parts of the brain. So, the early bilinguals did not show much difference, but late bilinguals showed increased activity in the prefrontal cortex. There was one interesting study on uh, FM, uh, fMRI study on Spanish monolinguals. Now, they had to judge whether the nouns they, uh, that were presented to them was masculine or feminine. Spanish has grammatical gender. So, inanimate nouns can take either masculine or feminine gender based on certain rules. But the funny part is Italian has uh, two kinds of nouns. One is called the regular noun, another is the irregular nouns. So, regular nouns which means that there is a particular pattern. So, regular nouns ending in O will always take masculine gender and whereas, R, uh, nouns ending in A will always be uh, as feminine gender. So, this is how it goes. So, casa is a feminine uh, noun and caro is a masculine noun in this language. But they also have a large number of uh, words that are irregular. So, ending phoneme does not really tell us what kind of gender it will take. So, this the word that end with these, the, these various sounds can be either masculine or feminine, right. So, the C for example, uh, if we have, if we take E, so this also ends in E, this also ends in E, but one of them is, uh, this is feminine, this is masculine, la fuente versus el puente, right. So, this study was done by using this kind of words, both regular and irregular words and uh, both masculine and feminine gendered words were there. And then they were divided on these two terms. They had to just judge whether it is masculine or it is feminine. Now, as you expect, regular nouns will not pose any problem, but irregular nouns will pose a problem. So, that is what they also saw that irregular nouns had increased activity in three areas. Uh, this is connected to articulation superior and inferior part of the Broca's area. They also had um, added uh, activity in some other parts that are connected to increased cognitive effort. Now, the, why do we see this in this increased cognitive effort was because they the subjects reported that they were mentally connecting the words with the determiner to see what fits. So, that took them an extra effort and hence we find some different kinds of pattern. Now, based on this study, so if the processing is more effortful, we see a different brain area getting activated. This is what the study found out. Based on this study, another study was carried out and they compared um, late Spanish participants who learned Spanish at an early age that is native speaker and who also learn English later and gradually they become more proficient in English, something like many of us. So, we learned language one, uh, a first language in early life, later on learned English and over a period of time we become more proficient in English than our mother tongue. Similar kind of participants were used and another group was Spanish learner English speakers. So, they were learning Spanish, but they had first language was English. So, this was a late learning group, this was a comparatively early learner group. The stimulus was similar and the main problem was to check if the processing related brain areas are different for irregular nouns. So, early learners uh, showed increased activity in the inferior part of Broca's area like monolingual Spanish speakers would, but 
uh, late learners showed activity in area just below that area. So, basically there was a difference in terms of whether the participants are early learners or late learners in given the same kind of task conditions that is the finding. So, you see a lot of difference have emerged uh, in terms of various kinds of uh, task demands in terms of various language pairs that early learning early learner versus late learner bilinguals have different they, they seem to utilize different parts of the brain different areas of the brain for processing. Similarly, there are also lot of differences across monolingual and bilingual. So, in terms of age of acquisition we can easily say that the brain of a bilingual the structure of the brain of a bilingual will depend on they are different from monolingual and they also are different within the category itself in terms of age of acquisition. Monolinguals of course learn their first language early in life and early bilinguals also learn their second language early in life. So, that, that is now uh, established. Now, we move on to the parameter of proficiency. Proficiency is something that refers to how well you use your language whichever language right. So, this takes us back to Pitre's rule remember Pitre's rule in terms of aphasia that the language that is the in which the participant the subjects are better at which they use more is more resistant to disorders. So, this is what is basically we, uh, we are talking about we now call them proficiency. So, the language in which you are more proficient will be more resistant is what the idea is. So, in the modern times, studying expertise as an important part of cognitive mechanism was started by Adrian de Groot. Uh, he was a pioneer of studying two disparate things. In fact, if he studied chess and psychology together and he looked at chess players and how um, that they are different in terms of um, you know the proficiency level. So, if a good chess player versus a novice chess player and how their mental mechanisms are different, how their cognitive strategies are different and so on. So, one of his most well known experiments by the way this um, Degrote was himself a very quite an established uh, chess player himself. So, his in this in his one of his tasks he, um, they asked players were asked to look at a chess board for 2, two to 15 seconds and then they were asked to reconstruct from memory. So, primarily look at the chess board memorize how what is where and then after some time just tell the describe what was there. The finding was that one of the top players at that time uh, of the world at that time Max Yu who could recall 22 pieces on board. The degrade himself who, who did the study he could recall 21. However, other experts uh, could recall 16 average players 9 and so on. So, as you see the, the higher the proficiency in uh, the game the more the recall power better the recall power. So, even though the theory now goes that even though every player whether you are a novice or you are an expert they are all aware of the information and strategies related to the game right. Everybody knows the otherwise you will not be able to play. So, everybody knows the game, but where is the difference between an expert and a novice is the way they use that information right. So, this is this is the primary difference the cognitive strategic difference how you use information to your benefit. So, masters differ from novices not only in remembering more, but they could also quickly recall the gist of the position because in chess it is every piece is dependent on the other piece. So, you do not really need to recall remember each of them right. So, if you have understood the layout you already know where all the pieces will be. As a result the, the better you are in the game the better your chances of recalling the pattern because ultimately it is a matter of pattern learning. So, years later his student weekend um, uh, young man found out eye fixations were also different between an expert and novice players. So, the master's eye movements were smoother and faster and could zero in on the particular pieces more quickly and um, he specifically looked at the treatment of redundancy what is redundant right. So, in it, as I was just saying that in chess you do not really look need to look at every piece that will be redundant if you if you know if you have seen one piece then you know where the others will be. So, that bit is found in more in the in the experts than in the uh, novices because ultimately it comes down to pattern perception in terms of chase that is what he said. So, this is also a kind of a finding my, this is also this also supports Pitre's rule uh, albeit in a different domain. Now, coming to language 
what are the domains of language that will reflect difference in proficiency, right? That is the question that uh, that is our primary motivation here. So one of the first studies to check brain different activity differences among uh, monolinguals with different proficiency level was uh, Martha Kutas and uh, King, 1995. This was an EEG study. So these are the sentences that they gave. The reporter who the senator attacked discovered the error and reporter who harshly attacked the senator discovered the error, right. So the idea was to check differences in brain activity um, levels. The, the participants were uh, based on proficiency levels. So they were high proficient versus low proficient people. Now the question was who discovered the error, right. Now sentence 1 is more difficult than sentence 2 because of the structure, because of the way it was. Um, because this, this uses a less conventional layout and this leads to higher cognitive load. Now this is this as a result is more difficult to process. Now this the subjects were differentiated on the basis of verbal working memory test that is how we know who that uh, some people are low proficient, some people are high proficient. So the poor performance that is the uh, low proficient performance had higher LAN effect which is late anterior negativity. It is a negative going wave between uh, 250 to 600. Now both sentences were grammatically correct. However, the LAN effect is understood to reflect more effortful processing and that is why because the first sentence was grammatically correct and it was it also had a higher cognitive load because of the structure basically the using the clause inside the sentence where who the senator attacked. So that created slight uh, more cognitive load for the participant to process. So this was the finding. So uh, after this study, there were many such uh, similar kind of studies that uh, were carried out. Um, Neville uh, again 2010 found out short smaller waves for both LAN and P600 among high proficient monolinguals compared to low proficient speakers. So there is a difference in terms of brain activity as picked up by EEG in terms of proficiency. So higher, pro higher proficient people will have a different brain activity as opposed to low proficient people even in monolingual scenario. Now the basic finding from all studies, all such studies is that high proficient speakers what they primarily do is they could register errors and repair them quickly as we have seen in the uh, EEG studies because of the kind of um, EEG signals that we already have found out. So basically proficiency means more efficiency. So uh, high proficient um, uh, monolingual, a difficult grammatically complex sentence could be processed with much more ease of as opposed to. And how do we know that? Because of the brain activation levels which you already know are connected to differential uh, stages of uh, complexity. One nine, nine, 1995 study uh, reported the case of a Bolivian woman who had migrated to US at the age 7. Now this is this is an interesting uh, study that uh, talks about that proficiency is actually not a very concrete thing. Proficiency can change, proficiency can, uh, can really have probabilities. So this uh, lady, she started uh, showing signs of seizures at, at, at the age 19 and later on it was found that she had a um, brain damage in the left temporal area. So after a certain, uh, she needed a surgery and after the surgery, her language scores changed. So before surgery, she had um, she scored 19 out of 30 in Spanish naming test. However, after surgery, she scored only 32 out of 60 in Spanish. However, her score in English was good. That certain areas in the brain affects your L1 and L2 differently. Uh, and certain areas of the brain represent L1 and L2 differently was found out in this study. Yet another study in the domain of language loss, it is perfectly possible to typical understanding is that L1 which is learned first uh, is a language in which we are more proficient in, it is the most, it is the stronger language by uh, as far as Ribot's rule goes. Now there is a, a study that takes us to the end of the spectrum where the researchers asked a group of Koreans who were adopted in French families. So Korean children adopted into French families in their childhood. However, the age is very crucial here. They were adopted between 3 to 8 years of age. So what that means? That means is that their first language was well in place, right? They were already speaking in their first language when they were adopted. So when series of fMRI studies were carried out and they showed 
no difference in their performance in the brain activity as compared to native French speaker. So, they were trying to see if they are different in any way different uh, compared to the native French speakers because they are L2 learners of French. So, as a result it was taken as a, as a proof that they had lost their knowledge of Korean. In a follow up study um, on the same Korean group participants, they were asked to identify Korean sounds, some sounds that is that are typical to Korean language which are uh, easy for the Koreans but then very difficult to determine for non-native speakers. So, non-native speakers will not be able to recognize them but native speakers of Korean can. These subjects were asked to recognize those sounds. Now, the fundamental uh, premise here is that since they had left Korea after age 3, they were already speaking the language and meaning the sound system of the language must also be uh, quite well ingrained in them. However, the study revealed that they had lost sensitivity to their native language entirely. They could not recognize those sounds which are typical to their language which is typical to Korean. So, in all per for all purposes these Koreans were behaving like French monolinguals. So, it is perfectly possible to even lose your first language entirely. Now, the question is can they be recovered? There are some uh, claims that even though we can say that if there is a possibility that first language can be lost, but not everybody agrees. They say that uh, it is it is uh, not retrievable, but may not be completely irretrievably lost. So, this is the uh, case of language first language language loss in the in L1. There is now an agreement we have already looked at separate versus uh, shared system in the brain that um, there are in the initial stages there is L2 is uh, interpreted through L1 and L1 has an has a direct um, connection to your concepts as your proficiency grows you develop a better connection L2 also develops connection with the concepts and that gets better with proficiency as proficiency goes higher. So, now this is what we already have seen so we will not get into here. Now depending on what we have seen till now there have been proposals that proficiency should not be taken as a homogeneous entity. Proficiency uh, also may have different types within itself inbuilt, inbuilt differences because typically the tests of proficiency that are done are correlated with higher IQ and literacy levels. However, in the later on later uh, James uh, Cummins and Hernandez and others they have brought out variations within proficiency. What are these variations? Variations are basically in terms of the argument that they have given is that that uh, language consists of sub skills. Language is not just one homogeneous skill. So, there could be various layers of proficiency and hence it cannot be connected to IQ and academic performance entirely. So, it is quite possible that somebody is not uh, know academically uh, very well, but that does not really mean that they lack proficiency in their language entirely. So, the entire debate is based on a few points, few uh, key points that one is the standardized tests are uh, uh, typically they, they do not uh, take into account the spontaneous use of language. In other words, aspects of language connected to academic performance are typically related to standardized verbal IQ test. These tests do not have they, they do not really reflect the you day to day spontaneous everyday use of language right. So, this based on this there are two possibilities that they have uh, come up with one is called the cognitive and language proficiency another is called basic interpersonal communicative skill. So, the first kind of proficiency is what we have been traditionally been testing through various kinds of tasks which are in turn connected to IQ level and academic performance, literacy level and so on. However, the basic interpersonal communicative skill is also a kind of a proficiency level which does not necessarily depend on the IQ level. Now, this is the reason that we sometimes find second language learners having higher proficiency in L2 as compared with L1 users because when we learn a second language typically through formal training the language used is the standard language and there and also because it is typical of the uh, setting as a result of which they we are taught in that uh, academic language or the formal language and thereby 
we show often many or may, quite often many people show higher proficiency in L2 even compared to the L1. So, this is called the case of reverse language dominance. Now, this notion of two way uh, difference with uh, proficiency also kind of um, deals well with uh, a revised hierarchical uh, model that we have just seen. So, learner initially uh, they shift from L2 to L1 to concept load to L directly L2 to concept root with adequate practice over a period of time as and proficiency goes up and so on. So, for adult learners classroom learning relies more on cognitive approach thus leading to a stronger link as proficiency improves. So, because of the method of teaching L2 uh, to adults the connections that are set are different as opposed to when the L1 is learned. L1 is typically learned in a uh, non-formal societal kind of a setting as a result of which this does not really have a strong connection to cognitive approach as a result of which the, the there is a completely different trajectory there. So, thus BICS and CALP capture the difference between academic and everyday language proficiency. Now, depending on this they, they have also the dependence on different kinds of memory. We have already seen in terms of bi bilingual memory storage system that we have declarative and procedural memory. Now, declarative memory refers to the things right the what of it and procedural uh, memory refers to how we do things like the motor actions and so on. Now, the difference between BICS and CALP has can also be uh, uh, found out with uh, you know, correlating them with the two kinds of memory system in humans. So, every language depends more on procedural memory that is the sensory motor memory and on the other hand CALP requires more explicit instructions. So, you see how we are able to connect all of these things. So, declarative memory is connected to CALP, CALP is connected to the cognitive and um, you know a higher I IQ and uh, when we connect language learning to cognitive aspects and uh, formal training. However, BICS is the everyday use of language which is connected to procedural memory which is basically about sensory motor memory. So, naturally there are when you talk about proficiency in this term when your proficiency is divided into two categories then it is easier to understand as to why early learners and late learners show different kinds of activation level because they also have dependence on different memory systems right. So, that is about proficiency now we go on to uh, control mechanisms. Now, executive uh, control mechanisms basically include executive control. Executive control is um, uh, primarily a control mechanism that um, takes care of our top down processes. So, this includes uh, things like attention, selective attention, monitoring, inhibition, primarily talking about conflict monitoring and conflict resolution. This is what it is right. Uh, executive control is it uh, finally boils down to this. What do we mean by uh, control conflict monitoring? Uh, let me give you a simple example. So, there are two tasks that are given to me, there are two important salient cues in the environment, but I have been asked to do only one. How, how well I can suppress the other the other cue is, is, is a reflection of my executive control. So, in order to suppress the other cue I have to selectively attend to the important goal at that time. So, that is the, the cue that is important for my goal at that time. So, that is in a crux what an executive control includes. Um, now, separate brain areas are responsible for these various activities within executive control. Now, the question is again the same question whether monolinguals and bilinguals use the same brain areas or they use different brain areas for these functions for executive functions. In some studies involving these two groups similar activation patterns were uh, visible. For example, ACC these are uh, the brain areas typically understood to be controlling our executive control mechanism. So, anterior cingulate cortex which is ACC this is responsible for impulse control impulse control, decision making, various things like this. Now, in a combined Stroop task, fMRI task, Stroop task um, is a task that that is uh, used to check our conflict monitoring and conflict resolution capacity. For example, uh, if I ask somebody to, now I have written blue with, with red ink. 
Now the task will be uh, name the color of the ink. Now typically if you see this we will be more uh, uh, we it will tend to more name the name the word. So we will read it blue but actually the answer should have been red. So this is a stroop task right and so in a stroop task combined with fMRI study both monolingual and bilingual groups were found to activate the same region that is ACC. Similarly, in a different study using Simon task, um, I will include all of these uh, studies in the in the appendix. Um, so, the caudate nucleus was activated for both groups. So, basically there seem to be some similarity uh, across, uh, across groups in these tasks. However, another yet another study they uh, compared grey and white matter volumes in lifelong monolinguals versus lifelong bilinguals. They found some difference. What is the difference? They found that bilinguals showed more frontal low white matter. Remember in every other parameter also we have seen more dependence of bilinguals on the prefrontal cortex as opposed to the sensory motor areas. Right? So, this also uh, uh, takes us there that bilinguals showed more frontal lobe white matter. Uh, also older monolinguals showed decreased white matter in temporal lobes but not bilinguals. So, when they administered Stroop task on them white matter volume correlated with task performance. So, the, the higher the white matter volume the better the performance and the other and the other way around. So, these are the areas of the brain that are responsible for um, executive control hence because we have already seen that bilinguals have greater volume of higher white matter, monolinguals have comparatively less and bilinguals also perform better. So, there is a correlation. Now, the finding also takes us to a rather controversial uh, domain which is the domain of bilingual advantage. Now, what it says is that bilinguals are better equipped to handle challenging uh, tasks, to handle tasks that require inhibition of the another cue. So, uh, as of here in this in this particular study the finding also suggests that bilingualism itself alters brain physiology, brain physiology in terms of white matter density, white matter volume and so on. So, bilinguals perform outperforming monolinguals on this kind of tasks also has a uh, correlation with the brain, the st very structure of brain, the very very brain physiology. Similarly, the data from resting state uh, research also has uh, tried to see if the functional connectivity inherent in key areas uh, are different when there is no explicit task that is why it is called resting stage. So, there is no task given to the participants, but um, they are just checking the functional connectivity. Now, the question they were asking is does experience induce neuroplasticity modulate functional connectivity in bi bilinguals? What this means is that because bilinguals are handling two different languages at, the, at all the time, we just saw that it is it, there is a probability that it also alters brain physiology. Does it also show in neural connectivity in the resting stage phase, which seems to be the case. Then the evidence points towards the same. Another one study in 2017, they looked at ACC sulcation pattern uh, in monoling monolinguals and bilinguals and uh, participants also performed a flanker task. Um, I will uh, as I said Simon and flanker and Stroop task I will give an example of this all of this I will add in the appendix you can check. So, the main idea was to see if sulcation pattern was related to performance. We just saw uh, white matter density having a correlation with performance in monolingual versus bilingual this study looks as at sulcation pattern. Now, ACC sulcation variation was found to correlate with task performance. Bilinguals had more sulcal variation. We talked about sulcus and gyrus. So, uh, this is the, how the convoluted the brain uh, the cortical areas are. So, this is gyrus, this is a sulcus. So, uh, bilinguals had more sulcal variation and they also did better than monolinguals on all of these tasks. So, the authors proposed that early neurodevelopmental mechanisms depend on environment which again it can take us to cognitive efficiency and of course, we go this this ultimately this entire debate goes to cognitive bilingual advantage. Bilingual advantage we will discuss uh, in another uh, module in more detail as to how bilinguals by virtue of being bilinguals uh, 
probably train their brain differently. But till now so far we have seen that the bilingual brain does have some differences as opposed to monolinguals. Not only that in terms of physiology, in terms of activation pattern, in terms of how they um, perform on in different kinds of tasks there are differences and also within bilinguals themselves there are differences in terms of the activation pattern as well as structural pattern. So, which area of the brain gets activated whether it is sensory motor area or it is prefrontal cortex there are differences in that. So, yes bilinguals the bilinguals do have some differences from the monolingual brain in terms of all of these factors discussed. So, this is where we uh, come to the end of this segment it's the references. Thank you. Mm -hmm.